this course is on the New Testament. And therefore, this is that period of what happened before the New Testament began. So mm -hmm. it's a preamble. 400 years. That's right. That 400 years, yes. that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So just a quick review of the Old Testament and then moving, moving to the New Testament. That's, that's really what I wanted to hear with you. So the Bible. Most people know it as 66 books. Mm -hmm. uh, the Old and New Testament, that is what the Christian Bible is essentially called. Uh, the, but the Christians obviously did not come up with the Bible. They inherited those texts. Uh, basically, the early Christ followers, uh, they inherited an entire collection of Jewish holy books from Jesus and from the apostles, who were all Israelites. So kind of came as a part of the package. And therefore, we could say that the Bible of Jesus, the Jewish Bible, became the Bible of Christians really 2,000 years ago. And that's how you know, that tradition uh, becomes a part of Christianity. All right? So the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Jewish Bible, has 24 books written by different authors for a period of approximately a thousand years, maybe longer. I don't know. The dating gets a little fuzzy. If we're going to follow and believe the dating of the Bible, we kind of have to approximate a lot of times. So there's lack of correspondence. But let's say a thousand years. That's of actual writing. It doesn't mean that those events happened a thousand years ago. Those events have happened long. It's that when they were actually written down yeah. is a different story. And then there's some editing that went on a little later, too. Because remember, those texts become copied and occasionally get edited a little bit, so uh, things change. But basically, if you were to read the Hebrew Bible, it's full of all sorts of content. You have the historical narratives, you have the short stories, you have moral tales of all sorts, you have laws, you have commandments. You have prophecies, you have these exhortations, these sermons, poetry, songs, and all sorts of admonitions and wisdom. I mean, it's very diverse. The Bible is full of all sorts of information. Sometimes quite scandalous, actually, you know, but, uh, but it's real life. That's, that's what it's like. Now, the Bible was written and presented by ancient Israelites who spoke Hebrew language. And therefore, we call it the Hebrew Bible for a reason. Hebrew language is a Middle Eastern language, Semitic language. Uh, it's written from right to left. It's a little bit different uh, from Western languages. And so the Hebrew Bible is these 24 books uh, written in Hebrew. The breakup is the Torah, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then you have the Nevi'im, the prophets, okay, which are divided into former prophets, letter prophets. Uh, you know, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings are considered the former prophets. I know that Christians don't think of them as prophets. I mean, I have never heard of Christians talk about Joshua being a prophet. <laughs> but in Jewish tradition, he's considered a prophet. You know, why former? Because this is the early history, mm -hmm. okay? And then latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Now those, all Christians believe to be prophets. But these are people who came later in history. As far as we're going to compare uh, Samuel and Joshua, for example, and Judges. You know, Book of Judges talks about very early period of Israel's history, where Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah talk about much later periods of history. So we call them latter because they're later in history, essentially. Um, and then you have the 12 prophets together. Uh, that collection is called the Trey Asar, and, um, and that's all what Christians call minor prophets. The reason why they're called minor prophets, not because their message is not important, it's because they're short. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Compared to the other prophets, they just didn't say that much. Okay, so, and in the Jewish tradition, they were all in one scroll, which is called the 12 all together as a collection. And that's prophets. Now, the uh, next section, the third section is writings, Kitavim, and you have uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, 
Ezra and Nehemiah, and the book of Chronicles. That's the Jewish order. That's the Hebrew Bible order. Now, the Christian order is a little bit different. The Old Testament does not end with Chronicles. If you were to flip to the end of the Old Testament, it's going to end with the book of Malachi, which would be the minor prophet. But that is not how the order of the Hebrew Bible goes. So in Jewish tradition, it's, it's a different order. It, ends, it ends with the book of Chronicles. In a sense, you know, it begins with history and then it ends with history. <laughs> kind of a recap. Um, so, uh, a little bit different. So, so you have the, the Law of the Prophets and the Writings, the three sections of the Hebrew Bible. And this is how it works out. So you might have heard this name before. The, you take the first letters of these titles. Torah, Nibim, Ketuvim. T, N, K. T, N, K. And together they form this abbreviation. Tanakh. Tanakh means, it just means the Jewish Bible or the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a very normal way of referring to it. So if you hear, if you hear people talking about Tanakh, what they mean is Torah, Nevim, Ketuvim, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. That's what they're talking about, essentially, those uh, uh, 24 books. So um, Jews have 24 books, Christians have 39 books, but it's the same books. And the reason is because Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah are broken into individual sections mm -hmm. by Christians where Jews just see Kings as one book, uh, mm -hmm. Samuel as one book, <laughs> Ezra, and Nehemiah, one book. And so that's why the number is different, but it's the same exact content. Um, no difference whatsoever. Now, then there's the Greek New Testament. So the Old Testament, and we have the New Testament. And, and that's written during the first century CE, okay? So if the Hebrew Bible had been written, let's say Moses was the first writer of the Hebrew Bible. Let's say Moses actually did write, which we don't have reason to believe that he didn't. Uh, that would have been, you know, 1,500 years before Jesus. So that's what I'm saying. It's like roughly about 1,000 years writing. And then Malachi or the Minor Prophets stopped writing around years 500 BCE. So you have basically about a thousand years of writing, and then it stops for a while. Then it picks up again. So the New Testament picks up in the first century of the Common Era, okay? And it's a collection of 27 books, which is unique to the followers of Christ. So Christians are the only people who truly utilize the New Testament. Jews do not read the New Testament because it's not something that came out of their community, it came out of... Uh, followers of Christ, the, the teachings of Jesus and things like that, and the apostles. And so as a result, uh, Christians developed a terminology, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, because they call their teachings the New Testament, they call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament. Although Jews never call it that, because to them there's only one testament. <laughs> so there's no such thing as old, new, it's just one. Uh, but there is that terminology. So if you ever hear, you'll hear Christians talk about Old and New Testament. You'll never hear about Jews talking about their Bible, calling it the Old Testament. Uh, and so the word testament means covenant. Uh, and if you're interested where that idea comes from, you can check it out in Jeremiah 31, for example, where God says, Behold, I'm going to make a new covenant with Israel and Judah. Not like the covenant I made with your ancestors when I took them by the hand out of Egypt and so things like that. So if you want to understand the idea of the covenants, that's very early on. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all have covenants. Noah has covenants. So this idea of, of covenant agreement with God and that goes on for the whole history. So when we talk about new covenant, old covenant, the New Testament or the new covenant is actually in Jeremiah. So it's not in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament if you want to. That makes it sound really funny. But that's what it is, because we're talking about a theological concept, an idea that God is making a new contract, or a new agreement, a new, uh, sort of say, uh, relationship, let's put it that way. So the New Testament, that is what it's called, Koine Diatheke, uh, and the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. Koine Greek is a very particular Greek variety, it's called Common Greek. Uh, I like to call it Street Greek, because it's not the language of the philosophers. It's the language of the average person. In fact, that is the Greek that most non-Greeks spoke. Think of it that way. Uh, and 
and, and that's the language of the New Testament. So it's a European language, which became an international language throughout the entire Mediterranean. Uh, by the first century, it was thoroughly a very, very international language, and therefore it would make sense that people would want to write books in a language in which you would get the most readership. So uh, Jewish communities, especially the Jewish communities outside of the land of Israel, and at that moment, most Jews lived outside of the land of Israel in the first century, uh, actually spoke Greek. Why? Because that was the international language of the day. Just like today, people speak mm -hmm. English because it's the international language. And, and so it's normal. Language is just that. Um, it changes. So in the New Testament, what we have, we have Gospel and Acts, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, uh, Luke, Acts, and John. Then we have Paul's letters to groups and individuals, a whole list, Romans, Corinthians, <coughs> Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians. These are all written to communities, to cities, to towns, to groups of people. And then you have individual letters, like to Timothy and Titus and Philemon. These are addressing very specific individuals in the life of Apostle Paul that he wanted to speak to. And we have those letters. So essentially, when we're reading New Testament, we're kind of reading somebody else's mail, if you want to think about it. It's kind of like me going into your mailbox and reading a letter from your relatives or your friends, you know, who happen to say some pretty good things, right? <laughs> but that's kind of what we're doing. If you think about it, it's weird, but a lot of the New Testament is letters. So you have general letters like James and Peter and John uh, and Jude. Uh, they're not written to a particular person. They're not written to a particular community. They're just kind of holistic teaching of the apostles that's being broadcasted to all followers of Christ. And then you have exhortations like Revelation and Hebrews. Okay, so those are those are the Hebrews, of course, is a book that talks about sacrifices and talks about how uh, Christ is better than all those things that we have seen so far. You know, and 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 Revelation is visions and songs and uh, prophecies of the future, all sorts of interesting uh, ideas. Uh, very very unusual books. Certainly do not fit into the letters, and certainly do not fit into the Gospels. Right, so they're kind of unique unto themselves. So that's, that's what they have. So together, all we have between the, uh, the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament, we have you know, 24 or 39 books, depending who counts. And then the Greek New Testament is 27, and that together makes 66 books of the Bible. That's how we know it today. So that is your entire collection. So in between the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament, as you know it today, there's this period of about 400 years. We have Hebrew Bible written in Hebrew, Greek New Testament written in Greek. And in between, what do you think is going to be? There's going to be some books, and some of them are going to be written in Hebrew, and some are going to be written in Greek. Because why? Hebrew is still very much a language of a culture, and Greek is becoming more of a language of a culture. So you're going to have a mix, essentially. Mm -hmm. By the time the first century comes, yeah, everybody speaks Greek, but, you know, in the second century, maybe not everybody yet, you know. So you're going to see a mix of these two, all right? And that is the period. This era is what we call the intertestamental period, 400 years between the Testaments. Protestants call it intertestamental period. Jews call it second temple period. Now, Why? Because remember, Jews don't have the Old or the New Testament. So there's no such thing as intertestamental, because as far as they're concerned, there's only one, right? So they can't call it intertestamental. It makes no sense. So call it Second Temple period. Why? Because the Second Temple, this is the era uh, when the Second Temple was standing. Now when I say Second Temple, there's the First Temple that Solomon builds, right? Then it's being destroyed by the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. Then after Babylonians are gone, Persians, under Persians, the temple is being rebuilt. And that is what we call the Zerubbabel temple, is what we call the second temple. And then Herod, later on, improves it and makes it even better. And this is the temple that Jesus knows, this is the temple that the apostles know, and essentially we call it the second temple period because it is destroyed in the year 70 by the Romans. Mm -hmm. So that entire period, basically, from the from the restoration of the Persians and up to the year 70 in the first century 
is what Jews call second temple period because that was the main orientation of people. And, and, and so that's, that's kind of a different way to call that same era. So you will read some books that keep referring it to second temple period. Other books mm -hmm. you will read will talk about international. It depends who wrote the book. It depends whatever opinion they choose to espouse, basically, is how they're going to call it. What is this intertestamental period? What truly happened in that era? Now that we kind of had the idea, this is one testament, this is another testament, let's look at this in between time. Because before the New Testament happens, a whole lot of events occur. And, and they're kind of important. So here's the eras that we're looking at. These are kind of more or less concrete times. All right? Um, we have the Persian era, then the Greek era, then the Egyptian era then the Syrian era, then the Maccabean era, and then the Roman era. And so, of course, after the Roman era is when the New Testament really begins. Because when you start reading New Testament, who's in charge? The Romans. Mm -hmm. Now, when I talk about all these eras, you understand what I really mean is that these are not just eras of people. These are eras of rule. Mm -hmm. That means Persians are in charge. Greeks are in charge. Egyptians are in charge. So all these different kingdoms or groups, are, you know, power brokers, essentially are running the society uh, of Israel. And so because they are in charge, they get to call the shots and they get to affect the lives of people in a very tangible way. So this is the build-up to, uh, to the New Testament. So you can imagine by the time we get to the first century, people are pretty much sick and tired of everybody bossing them around, right? And what do you think they want? <laughs> they would pretty badly want to be independent. They're just like, we're done with all these foreigners coming in and telling us how to live our lives. It's hard. And, and so you can imagine the moment, like, what are people feeling? So the expectations of the Messiah are very sim so serious at that moment. Why? Because they're tired of being kicked around by everybody in a neighborhood. Look, Israel is a small country, small people. Uh, Certainly notable, but not very numerous, and very easy to control and subjugate because not that many, small territory. Uh, so let's begin. So the Persian era. So here's an example for you. This is straight from the second book of Chronicles, chapter 36. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you, all of his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So what do we read here in the second book of Chronicles? Essentially, we're reading the account. This is Jewish history telling us the King Cyrus, the Persian. Persians conquer the Babylonians. <coughs> the Babylonians come, take, a, take away uh, Judah into captivity, they destroy the temple, Persia takes over, and they say, all of you slaves who came here from Judah, you're free to go. Return back, go back to Judah. Uh, in fact, we're going to build a temple. That temple that Babylonians destroyed, we're going to rebuild it. Why? He says, well, the God, the God of heaven. He's giving me all this stuff, and I decide I want to give it to you. So it's kind of a very nice, benevolent way for a king to say, Hey, I can do something nice for you, and this is what I decided to do, and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to build a temple for God in Jerusalem. Now, some people read this and say, Okay, that means that Cyrus believes in the God of Israel. And the truth is, no. Because if we know the history, Cyrus didn't just build the temple for Israelites. He also built other temples for other people he conquered as well. So it's not that he's particularly fond of the God of Israel, per se. He has a different policy 
with which he chooses to control people. Okay? So if Babylonians wanted to take people away from their land and keep them in captivity as slaves and use them for their talents and power, just like Daniel would be, right? You read the stories about Daniel. And, you know, now, Persians have a different policy. How do you keep these people that you conquered loyal to you? You treat them nicely. You tell them, go live in the place where you came from. I'll help you worship your God as long as you keep paying taxes. Because all we really want from you is taxes. As long as you stay conquered and you recognize that we're in charge and you pay us taxes and tributes and then you don't try to rise up and go war against us, you don't try to join another kingdom or another country or another king and try to dethrone me as the king, as long as you keep peaceful and recognize that I'm in charge, I'll let you have your religion, I'll let you have your worship, I'm okay with you worshiping your God the way you want to worship, in fact, I'll even help. See, no problem. A different policy of control. Still, I still want control, but I want to control you differently. I will be nice to you, so you'll be nice back to me and not have a revolution, okay? So that's Cyrus's way, essentially. And uh, so th don't, don't think that, you know, Cyrus the Persian all of a sudden becomes the worshiper of the God of Israel. That's not exactly what these texts say. But he's still a pretty, you know, pretty useful figure in this case. He's, he's doing the will of God, let's put it that way. Whether he recognizes it or not, he's restoring Israel. So here's another text. This is another uh, text from a Persian era. This is Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Thus says... Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Sounds familiar? This is a different mm -hmm. book. This is the book of Ezra. <laughs> Sounds very familiar, right? Whoever there is among you of all his people, may uh, his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, at whatever place he may live, uh, let the man uh, for that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with the free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, the point is, of this text is very similar. Cyrus is telling him, you can go back, you can rebuild the temple, but in this case, it focuses a little bit more on the temple rebuilding. You know, we're serious about this, and so I'm going to help, but you guys need to also have a collection and support this, and not only go to Jerusalem, but also kick in some money to have this project restored. And of course, Cyrus is going to get the credit for it. You get the idea. So very, very, um, uh, sort of say, um, an interesting text. You know, it, it, it just tells us the same story from a slightly different vector. So that's from the book of Ezra. So you get the idea that in Persian time, Cyrus restores Jerusalem, restores uh, the temple in Jerusalem, and he continues to reign through his proxies. His government extends into Judah now, all right? And that's the Persian era. So the next era that comes is the Greek era. So from 397 to 336 is Persian. Then in 336 to 323, roughly, we have the Greek era. Now what happens then? Well, we have Alexander the Great who defeats the Persians. He defeats the Persian king, Darius III, in three battles, and he gives him the controls of the land of the Persian Empire, and he conquers Persia, Babylon, uh, Palestine, which is, you know, another word for, which is a Roman word for Israel, Syria, Egypt, uh, as, and as far as Western India. So Alexander the Great conquers a lot more than anybody else has. And so he only reigned over Greece for about um, 13 years. Um, he died at a very young age. Um, his influence lived long, long after him. So Alexander conquered a lot, but he's actually accomplished a lot more than, than, uh, than just the conquering. His main contribution is something a little bit different. You see, in this Greek era, this cherished desire that Alexander uh, was, was to to have this worldwide empire and unified, and this empire would be unified by Greek language and custom and the Greek civilization. 
So this is yet another way of having control over people that you take mm -hmm. over. You take over these people who are very different from you. Well, you teach them how to speak your language. You teach them how to live the lifestyle that you live with the conveniences that you have. You give them the same sets of values, essentially, that you have. And they slowly, without realization, blend and become more like you. And they then don't really have a reason to revolt against you. Well, because that would mean revolting against themselves. Because they've become like you in so many ways. What's the point of having a revolution against people who are just like me? So another way of control. And so uh, under his influence, basically the entire Western world, the entire Mediterranean, uh, began to speak and study Greek language. And we call this process Hellenization. It's not just language, okay? It's culture, it's worship. Imagine um, you know, the type of a culture that Greeks brought uh, besides philosophy and, and all these things, they, they brought in institutions. They had government you know, created and things like that. So some of the places were governed in very you know, tribal indigenous ways and all of a sudden Greeks bring these ideas of, of government uh, and a very structured government and voting, you know, democracy, things like that. All of a sudden, it's, these are all Greek ideas which we still espouse today. But uh, big changes come, and that's essentially the Greek era. Uh, you you kind of have that period of time where Greeks take over. Greek Greek era does not truly end; it actually continues. But the power center shifts from Greece, uh, where Alexander would have come from, from Macedonia, where which where he was originally from, to Egypt. So now it's the Egyptian era, and. The Alexander, Alexander the Great, the great conqueror, he dies in 323. And the empire that he has conquered, these massive lands, they become divided among his four generals. So the names of the generals are Ptolemy, okay, Lysimachus, Cassander, and um, Selenius. Now, you have also um, essentially these generals, because he has no children, he has no family, he's got nobody to give it to. He gives it to his closest friends, who happen to be the guys who've been fighting all these battles with him. Mm -hmm. And they take chunks of his empire. Now, you can imagine, what do generals do? Mm -hmm. Their job occupation, their entire preoccupation in life is to fight wars. Mm -hmm. And now I've got this country, and uh, I want a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're not going to stop doing what they do well. And that's the problem. So you have Ptolemy, the Soter, or the Savior, is called first of the, he's the first of the Ptolemaic dynasty, okay? He receives the country of Egypt as his allotment of the part of the empire that uh, Alexander um, captures. And it is Egypt that controls Israel. So Israel is kind of like annexed territory next to Egypt. Because if you know on the map, we're not talking about that far away. You basically have Egypt, and you have Sinai Peninsula, then you have Israel. So it's not hard for them to control both. And so essentially Egypt, or Ptolemy, that particular um, uh, general, he, he gets uh, Israel. And Israel becomes under his control. And now, he originally dealt quite severely uh, with Jews, but then towards the end of his reign, um, Ptolemy Philadelphus, his successor, he has a very favorable attitude towards the Jews. He has like almost friendship with, uh, with Israelites. And so relationship all of a sudden is good. A new successor comes in and, and things are much better. So Israel is a subjugated nation, but at least they're subjugated by a king who has been good to them. And that doesn't last. Because the next thing that happens is the Syrian era. The power shifts. Now, Ptolemy received Egypt. There was another general that received Syria. And Syria is just north of Israel. And so if he wants a little piece of his neighbor's king territory, what do you think he's going to conquer? Israel, because Israel is the next one <laughs> going towards Egypt. So these guys start war, and basically you have King uh, Antiochus, or Antiochus as he's pronounced in Greek, uh, Antiochus III, or the Great, 
uh, Israel comes under his control. He conquers it. He takes it away from the Ptolemies. So the Egyptian center loses power of Israel and it shifts that control over to the country that's Syria now. And that's uh, Antiochus, or uh, this is the Seleucid family. And a new policy arises from Antiochus IV. Antiochus III was okay, he just conquered Israel. Antiochus IV, in the year 168 BC, he has this new policy. And he sets out to destroy the distinctive characteristics of Jewish faith. He does not want Jews to be Jews anymore. So he forbids the sacrifices, outlaws circumcision and the Sabbath. Uh, Jews are forced to eat pork and make sacrifices to Greek gods, to idols. Very nice. You can see it is still a policy of control, but now I can't control you because you won't become Greek. The whole world is Greek, yet you are not. So we got to fix it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make it illegal to be anything but Greek. And so basically, the only way I can control you is if you become more like us. So I'm going to force you. So that's what he does with Israel. So Alexander allows Israelites to retain their own faith. Alexander the Great understands Israel as a people that have their own heritage, and he does not force Hellenism upon them. And originally, the Ptolemies might be harsh, but then they realize that Israelites have something unique, and they don't really want to force them to become Greeks as well. And now this is the next guy in line who basically says, no, I really want you to become more Greek. Let's get Hellenized. That's the idea of Hellenization. Now all of these people are already become Greeks, like Syrians. Syrians is a Middle Eastern culture, right? But they already speak Greek. They don't speak Persian anymore. They've forgotten that language. That language is gone. Greek is in. So why can't we make Jews do the same? That's the idea. And, and the idea is, again, control. So Jews are used to, to, to eat pork sacrifice to idols and things like that. And so he decorates the Jerusalem temple uh, by building the altar and offering a sacrifice to Zeus. That's what Antiochus IV does. A really terrible thing. I mean, if you can imagine it from a Jewish perspective, it's like that's the worst thing ever you can possibly do. And, and that creates a problem. So we had the... Egyptian era, the Syrian era, so the Syrians control uh, Israel, and that leads us into the next era, which we call the Maccabean era. Maccabees are a family, uh, and by, by the policies that Antiochus has instituted in Israel, he basically stirred up revolution, he stirred up trouble. Mm -hmm. So when a Syrian official tried to enforce the pagan sacrifice in one particular village in Israel, a village called Modin, just bits away between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, um, basically an elderly priest named Metathias saw that and he couldn't take it. He revolted. He says, no way, we, we, we're not going to sacrifice to pagan gods here. So he kills the Syrian official. Uh, he, and he flees to the mountains with his family. Because if you're going to kill one of the envoys of the king, you know you're in trouble now because they're coming for you. So he runs to the mountains and they hide out. And they basically fight, fight a guerrilla war. That's what they do. A revolution. Uh, and so thousands of other Jews follow him. And they all live out there in the, in the wild in the mountains. And they hide out. And they carry out these military raids and operations upon the Syrian uh, troops. Essentially what happens, Mattathias dies, but his sons carry on the revolt. And by the year 165, they succeed to retake Jerusalem and to cleanse the temple from the idolatry that was brought in there and restore the Jewish worship back. And this event is commemorated today through the festival of dedication or Hanukkah. So if you're familiar with the Feast of Hanukkah, that's what it's about. It's about, it's about Jews taking the temple back from the Syrians who have defiled it and restoring the worship. So if you want to think of Hanukkah as the spiritual 4th of July, kind of like the spiritual Independence Day, <laughs> that's really what it is. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's like that. And, and so Hanukkah is depicted in the book of John. In, in chapter 10, verse 22, where you actually have Jesus celebrating Hanukkah. It says that he went to the temple and it was a feast of dedication. So that feast of dedication is that feast. It was still celebrated 
uh, in those days. But of course, this is only you know 160 years away from the actual event. So, so the Maccabees, the Hasmonean family, um, these priests that led the revolution essentially became the new leaders of Israel. And that was a cardinal mistake they made because priests are not supposed to be kings. The Torah does say that king is king and priest is priest. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to be both because that's too much power. Too much power. You know, there's this idea of separation of power. Mm -hmm. Because a priest is in charge of the entire faith, all of the religious things, you know, that happen in Israel. And the king is in charge of all of the political uh -huh. arena. And now you combine those two together. Well, that's a lot of power. Now you control mm -hmm. everything, essentially, in people's lives. You control the economy, the politics, and their worship. That's too much. So, uh, essentially, the Hasmonean family, they set up themselves as kings. They weren't originally kings, but they started acting like kings. And that brought their downfall. They started infighting and all sorts of terrible things happened. And out of that story, we come to the next era. Because the Maccabean era ends as they fight out for their power. And the new era, the Roman era, begins. So uh, the Jewish independence, essentially, these you know, years of independence, end in the year 63 BCE. It ends when the Roman general named Pompey conquers Syria, okay, and then he proceeds to move down to Israel. So Pompey basically brings an end to this independence. And this is when we have a person by the name of Antipater, an Edomian convert to Judaism, who is appointed a procurator of Judea by Julius Caesar in the year 47. Now, you probably know Antipater's son. His name is Herod, or as we know him, Herod the Great. So, you have to understand that Antipater is a convert to Judaism. He's an Edomian from the area of Jordan. Uh, Maccabees conquered that land. They also expanded their kingdom, and one of the people they conquered were Edomians, and they basically told the Edomians, become Jews or die. They said, oh, well, we'll become Jews, no problem. <laughs> what does it take? And well, it says, well, you got to get circumcised and keep our laws. And they said, okay, it's okay. So Antipater is one of those Edomians who essentially becomes an Israelite, uh, accepts the faith and tradition of Jewish people, and he is part of the ruling class together with those priests, uh, Maccabean priests, and then he's just in the right place at the right time when the Romans come. And Romans do not want to appoint somebody who is an Israelite, so they pick this guy because he's a little bit of an outsider. He's an Edomian, even though he's a convert. Santipater becomes a procurator, and then Herod becomes eventually king. He becomes king of Jews in the year 40 BC. Uh, so that's he's appointed by the Roman Senate to be the king. Romans give him the power. Because remember, Romans conquered Israel, so they call the shots. They, they, whoever they say is king is king. And so we know this era uh, of, of time as the Roman era. But this is also an era of extreme Jewish sectarianism. By sectarianism, I mean Jews are very much divided among themselves. There are different teachings that rise up. There are different attitudes that come up in this era. Uh, there's not one Judaism. It has never been. But at this point, it's even more fractured. So essentially, you have people like Pharisees, and scribes, and Sadducees, and Herodians, and Zealots, and Essenes, all of these groups of people that you might have heard about they all come up out of this era, okay? And this is, you know, remember, Herod the Great dies in the year 4 BC. And as we start reading the Gospels, that's where Jesus is born. Remember, Herod is dying, Jesus is born. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that historical moment. So this is where the New Testament picks up. But what you have to appreciate is what leads up to this era. 
Because now you understand what the people of Israel are feeling, what they're experiencing, what they've been through, the history of changing power. And that leaves Israelite society very fractured. So when we, you and I start reading the New Testament, we read about Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. We say, who are these people? Why, where did they come from? This is where they come from. They come from the times that were very turbulent, very divisive. Their loyalties are divided between different political groups and parties, between religious groups and parties, between a group of Jews that thinks this way and that way. And so these are expressions of Jewish society that are each seeking the good of Israel, but in their own way. And they all understand what it, like, what it means to be a true Israelite, a true Jew, in their own terms. Because whatever undergirds their beliefs is a little bit unique to them. Let's put it that way. These groups disagree with each other. They have some major disagreements. They agree with each other on probably about 80 to 90% of the things. But then the 10 the 20% of the things they disagree on, they really disagree on. And that's where all the fighting happens. So when you read the New Testament, and there's all these discussions and disagreements and arguments, that's what they rotate around. They all rotate around these ideas that these different groups do not agree on. Now, in come Jesus, comes Jesus in the midst of all these groups. And what does he do? He presents yet one more opinion. <laughs> Among all of these, these opinions already exist, and he adds yet one more thing, right? I say unto you. <laughs> and then you have that. So this is the environment. That's, that's what I want you to imagine. Ha thinking this way now, think about the New Testament content. Think about what happens in the Gospels. The things that Jesus says, the things that he does, are now framed in the context of this history. Who Herod is, who Herodians are, it all starts to make sense. Now, I've unloaded a lot of stuff on you guys. So let's, let's have a little discussion. Okay. You guys ready for a little discussion? I've given you a lot of history. Give me some feedback. What are, what are you thinking? Does this make sense? Is there other gaps in history that you, know, you want me to talk about a little bit more or explain? Did I throw in some terms that you're not familiar with? What are you thinking? Is this familiar territory that I'm taking you in, or not familiar territory? It is familiar, but I wasn't aware of that so much change of power. Yes, yeah, in a short period of time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's just like it just kept new new people, new people yeah. coming and taking over, coming and taking over, mm -hmm. and each new power brings their own way of doing things, and splits loyalties because you have to think about people who are on the ground. Like here you are, let's say you're a Jerusalem aristocrat, right? And the power sweep switches to Egyptians. So who, who are you going to align yourself with? You're quickly going to go make friends with the king of Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to say, quickly, get some gifts. Whatever, what do we got? Grain, horses, gold, jewelry, let, bring, bring it, bring it. Slaves, whatever. Now let's, let's, let's go to Egypt and give him a gift so he's nice to us. Let's make mm -hmm. friends. Let's make a big party. So you made a friend with this guy, and then you get conquered by the Syrians. Mm -hmm. Quickly, quickly, make a friend with the Syrian guy. Because if we don't, he's going to destroy us. Wow. Because that guy is not helping us, because he got mm -hmm. defeated. So we can't ask him for help, because he's got his own problems. So you're stuck between all these powers uh -huh. that are looking for control, and Israel is a small country stuck in the middle of it all. And every new guy that comes and wants to conquer the world, they end up conquering Israel. And you gotta deal with the change of power. New flag goes up <laughs> on the wall, new flag every time. So you can imagine, this is frustrating. I'm glad the whole uh, intertestamental era makes sense to you guys. Uh, a couple more words and then we'll break. All right, I got this, this whole idea of the years of silence, the 400 years of silence is not exactly true, okay? They yeah, call it 400 silent years Protestants do, but the truth is many, many books were written in that era, okay? And only these were, writings were not deemed to be canon, they were not deemed to be Bible, they were not deemed to be inspired, and so they continue to exist as books, as spiritual literature, essentially, uh, but it was anything but silent. So one of the group of books that you see is um, uh, these books between the Testament is called Apocrypha. Maybe you've heard that title before. Apocrypha. Now remember, 
These are, the names are hypothetical. They were just made up by people. Apocrypha is the name. It's just something that people made up. It means hidden things. There's nothing hidden about it. There's nothing secret about it. Everybody knows what it is. Uh, but, you know, it's just the types of things that this book discusses. Maybe not open to everyone. It takes a little bit more understanding. So what are, what are the books of the Apocrypha? Uh, works like First and Second Ezra, um, Tobit, Judith, Greek Book of Esther. There's a version of the Esther that's Greek that's different from the Hebrew. Uh, wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, which is also called the Wisdom of, uh, of Jesus, the Son of Sirach. Baruch, Letter of Jeremiah, Additions to Daniel, Prey of Manasseh, First and Second Maccabees. See, these are the historical books that talk yeah. about the Hanukkah events and all that yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, these are all the books that were written in that era. Well, there's more, but these are some of the main ones that we call Apocrypha, you know, and, uh, and they were included uh, in some collections of the Bible. Like, for example, all of these books exist in Greek. Okay, mm -hmm. and when the uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible was put together, they lumped these books with the biblical books into one collection. And then when Jerome uh, translated mm -hmm. the Bible into Latin, he added those books to the Bible because he says, well, they're in a Greek Bible, yeah. so maybe it should be in our Bible too. So he added them at the end, kind of like additional books. By the way, let's read these two kind of thing. And that caused a little bit of a, of a controversy. So basically in the 16th century, Catholics decided to add those books into the canon. They officially proclaimed these books to be good and canonical and all of that. So they're called deuterocanonical books sometimes, but basically they were added. So Catholic Bibles will have these books. Yeah, Protestants didn't. You know, Luther looked at those books and he said, yeah, they're good, but not good enough. <laughs> and he says, not going to include them. Plus, Luther wanted to be not like Catholics, so that would make sense. He needed to do something different, right? So he did. Uh, so that's Apocrypha. Then you have the other group of books called Pseudepigrapha. This is a book, a group of books from about 200 BC to about 100 CE, uh, and it is a collection of all sorts of um, history and psalms and wisdom literature. Even some Christian editions are, can be lumped into this pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha means false writings. Uh, meaning these books are, are being given titles and names of famous people who didn't write them. You know, uh, the names of apostles will be placed upon them, or some famous biblical person, which we know for a fact that they didn't have anything with writing of these books. So in a sense, I write a book, I want to make it popular, I decide to publish it with the author's name who is famous, so that people read my stuff. That's the idea. Or I imagine that that's what this person would have said if they said it. So I kind of write it for them. However you want to look at it, it's not dishonest from the perspective of people of that time, that's what they did. So, uh, so you have these um, writings by these anonymous authors. We don't really know who wrote these books. And, and they were never regarded as canonical, they were never required, regarded as scriptures, uh, yet nevertheless they're inspirational literature, which many groups read. People read not just the Bible, people read other spiritual books, and these were these other spiritual books which they read and enjoyed and took things from and, uh, and learned from. And so Pseudepigrapha was a part of, sort of say, the library of ancient people. And, uh, and if we want to understand the context of that era, reading those books helps because we're entering the world of those people. We're essentially repeating their journey by reading what they read. And, and it helps us a little bit, so they're helpful. Uh, and a lot of people throughout history have uh, recognized that. So that's soon bigger fun. There you go.